Welcome to Chapter 2, Section 1 in College Algebra. In this video, I'm going to go through some notes, <clears throat> talk to you about some definitions, and use these notes which were originally prepared for Blitzer's College Algebra 5th edition. And we're talking about the basics of functions and their graphs. And part of that conversation needs to involve turning down the gain on my microphone, there we go, a definition of a relation. And a relation is, very simply put, any set of ordered pairs. And we're going to see definitions of ordered pairs. And you know ordered pairs as being like x comma y. Those x and y values aren't necessarily always numerical values. You could have your x values could represent animals, and your y values could represent the corresponding color of their fur or something. So it's any set of uh, ordered pairs. The x values, or the first elements in each ordered pair, if you take all of those elements and you put them together, that constitutes the domain. And the y values, or second element of each ordered pair, put those all together, and that's called the range. A function is a very specific type of relation. Essentially, it's a type of relation where you don't have any repeated x values. So if you looked at all of the ordered pairs, you wouldn't find the same x value twice. And here we see an example, and I'm just scanning through, looking at the x coordinates, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, this is the, an example of a function. And then these little notes on here are highlighting the elements which are in the domain and in the range. So if we look at this first example problem, we need to determine here whether this relation is a function. And I will let you scan through and look at the x values. Do you see any repeated x values? 10, negative 2, negative 1, 5, no repeated x values, therefore this relation is a function. I'm not going to write it down, but the domain, well, I will write it down actually because notation wise you need to know that the domain when you have a list of values should appear in set braces. And depending on who your professor is and what software you're using, etc. you may need to order those values from least to greatest. I apologize, let me make that part of the screen a bit bigger. There we go. Much better. All right, so that set represents the domain, and <clears throat> this set represents the range. Now you'll notice that as far as the y values are concerned, there is a repeated y value. That's okay. It's still a function. It just so happens that the range contains fewer values than the domain. And that's not a problem. Functions as equations. Um, Usually we don't see sets of ordered pairs. Usually a function looks something more like an equation. In the second bullet there, you're seeing a y equals equation. And we could just as well replace the y value with the kind of terminology that says f of x or g of x, something like that. And in a word problem, your x values and your y values, your output values, might have units associated with them. Um, in a one-to-one -one function, you will see only one x value per y value, one and only one. Uh, but in a, more specifically, just staying in generality as far as functions are concerned, for each x value, there's only one y value, or they say here, one and only one, really trying to drive that point home. So again, no repeated x values. The variable x, which is our input value typically, uh, 
is referred to as the independent variable, and the output values, which depend on our input values, those are referred to, or the output value is referred to as the dependent variable, which usually, as far as equations that we've grown up seeing, that's usually the y value. Not always, but usually. Determine whether each equation defines y as a function of x. We could take our first equation and subtract x squared from both sides. And I would say that more specifically, now our um, equation defines y as a function of x. You could plug some x values in there, do some arithmetic, and that would generate your y values. In the second equation, can we say the same thing? Mm, not really immediately, because some work is being done on that y value by squaring it, but we could take the square root of both sides So we have, uh, when we take the square root of both sides there, we need to put a plus or minus in front of the square root symbol. Now, is it a function of x? Well, you could plug x values in and multiply them by 4 and take the square root. And then, for example, if we plug in an x value of 1, 1 times 4 is 4, square root of 4 is 2, but then you have to address this plus or minus symbol. So the x value of 1 being put into this equation, when you multiply it by 4 and take the square root, you get a 2. But then you also need to take into account that there's that negative sign as part of the plus or minus symbol. And negative 2 would also be an output value. Here, you can see that in th just this little relation, which is only a portion of the entire function, or the entire uh, input-output output relation here that we're looking at, you see the repeated x values. So while we could get y defined as a something of x, it's not going to be a function by definition of x. And in our next equation, y is not immediately defined as a function of x, y has that operation being performed on it, the cube. We could solve this equation for y. Initially, y to the third equals 27 minus x, and then if we took the cube root of both sides, we would get y is equal to the cube root or third root of 27 minus x. I would say at this point, now you're really looking at a function and it is a function where y is defined as a function of x. I mentioned function notation a moment ago, and we often use function notation, and it looks like this, f of x, and we read it as f of x, and this is really taking the place of a y value. You can use them interchangeably. The nice part about function notation is if I want to plug a specific x value into my equation, all I have to do is say, for example, f of 2. And this is basically a set of instructions that says, take the number 2 and plug it into the function. Instead of me having to, having to write out using English and say, please replace all of your x values with the number 2 and then calculate a y value. This says all of that already. So as a matter of efficiency, it's good. And then we'll build some composite functions and do some somewhat unusual stuff with it later. Uh, this illustration is just saying you can see there's an input value that's the x value. f is the name of that particular function. And what comes out, you used to maybe think of it as a y value. Now you can think of it also as an f of x value. Evaluate this function, f of x equals 3x plus 2, for the following values. 
So these instructions are telling us that we would like to take the number 4 and plug it into our function. And then we're going to do something maybe a little bit unusual. And we're going to plug in not just a number, but an entire expression. We're going to plug in an x plus 1. And then maybe less unusual, we'll plug in a negative x. And let's process the 4 first. So f of 4 says plug in a 4 in place of x. So we get 3 times 4 plus 2. That's 12 plus 2, which makes 14. That one's pretty straightforward. This one's a little more unusual. We're going to take f of x plus 1, which means we're replacing all of the x's in the original function replacing all the x's there, and there's only one on the right hand side of the equation, with x plus 1. So we would say that this is equal to 3 times the quantity, x plus 1, and then don't forget the plus 2 at the end, and if you distribute and combine like terms, you will get 3x plus 5. And finally, plugging in a negative x, f of negative x is equal to 3 times negative x plus 2, which just simplifies. There's not any real arithmetic to do there. I'm going to write my answer on the next line. I would write that as negative 3x plus 2. And uh, option B is the correct response, so you see all of them typed up there. The graph of a function is really the graph of infinitely many points, where each point is represented by an ordered pair. And there's a graphical or visual way that we can test to see if the graph that we're looking at is the graph of a function. And the way that we do that is using the vertical line test. A lot of you probably know what the vertical line test is already but I will reiterate it here just for refresher sake. And what it says is that if you can draw a vertical line, so I'm not even reading what's on the screen at the moment, I'm just giving you my interpretation of it. The way that I phrase it is, if you can draw a vertical line that crosses your graph at more than one point, then your graph is not the graph of a function. So you can take what I said, rewind it, write it down using uh, the way that I phrased it. You can copy down what's in this blue box here, whatever makes most sense to you. And we'll see an example of it. Obtaining information from a graph or from graphs. Closed dots indicate that the graph is stopping there, that the graph does not extend beyond that point and it also indicates to us that that point is included as part of the graph. If you had an open dot, what looks more like a little circle at the end of a graph, that's indicating that the graph stops there, but that that specific point is not actually included in the graph. And if there's an arrow, that tells us that the graph is continuing on forever. So this little illustration here, regardless of what it's intended for, you notice that it has a colored in dot or a closed dot there, and it has a closed dot here. And that is uh, often, or that sort of notation, corresponds to the use of square brackets as opposed to parentheses. So again, the closed dot means that we're including that point. And another notation that we use to include a point or include a particular value is the square bracket, sometimes called a closed bracket. An x-intercept happens when a function crosses the x-axis. A y-intercept happens when or is where your function crosses the y-axis.
x-intercepts are also sometimes referred to as zeros of your function. And we're going to see all of these things later with some actual examples. And the zeros of a function, this is a nice definition actually of zeros of a function. The zeros of a function are the x values that when you plug them into the function as x values cause an output value of zero or a y value of zero. And just from looking at this graph right here, I'm going to put a point on here, like this point right here. Do you know what the coordinates of that point are? I don't. Well, I know one of them. Since that point is on the x-axis, I know that it has a y value of zero. So there is some x value, like lowercase a, that when we plug it into our function, it returned a value of zero. Therefore, a is called a zero. The same way that an annoying person could be called a headache, because that person, when they come into your life, causes you to have a headache. A is coming into the life of the function and causing a zero output value, so we call A a zero. I just make these analogies up off the top of my head. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good. That one was decent. To find the y-intercepts, you look for the points at which the graph crosses the y-axis. I mentioned that already. And if you do have a point that's on your y-axis, this point is going to have an x-coordinate of 0. And you could find the y-coordinate by taking an x-value of 0, plugging it into your function, and doing some arithmetic and generating that corresponding y-value. Let's use the vertical line test here to determine whether or not the graph is a function. Is this graph the graph of a function? Can you draw a vertical line that crosses this upside down parabola at more than one point? Mm, this vertical line doesn't. This vertical line doesn't. This one doesn't, 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 doesn't. It doesn't look like it's going to be possible for us to draw a vertical line that crosses the graph at more than one point. All right, so it is a function because it passed the vertical line test. And now we want to state the function's domain. This thing definitely looks like a parabola, but even if it weren't, it looks like as it continues downward, maybe downward and to the left, as it continues to go down, it will continue to go to the left. How far to the left? All the way. And how far as it continues going down and to the right, as it keeps going down, will it continue going out to the right also? And the answer is yes. Therefore, we can say that the domain of this function goes from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity, which is another way of saying all real numbers. What about the range of this function? So again, domain says how far to the left and how far to the right does the function go? That's a very loose definition, but it's a definition anyway. What about the range? Now we're talking about y values. How low do the y values go? How high do the y values go? Because these arrows are aiming in the downward direction, I only really need one of those arrows to be aiming in the downward direction, and that tells me that this curve goes all the way down toward negative infinity. And at the top of the curve, it has a maximum or a largest y value right up at the top of the curve. And that point has a y value or a range value of 4. Now, does the curve actually hit that point right there? Does it actually have a point on the curve that has a y value of 4? And I'm going to say the answer is yes. How do I indicate? Excuse me, how do I indicate that when I'm writing out my range like this using interval notation? And the answer is with a square bracket.
So if you need to put in your notes that we used that square bracket because the largest y value does actually reach a value of 4, put that into your notes somehow that it's going to make sense to you when you're reviewing your notes later. Uh, what about x-intercepts? Where does our graph cross the x-axis? It looks like this blue curve is crossing here and it's crossing here. So I would say that our x-intercepts happen at x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. negative 3 and 1. <clears throat> That's not an ordered pair. This is a list of x values. And what about the y-intercept or intercepts? There's one. It has a y value of 3. So our y-intercept is 3. This is a very specifically articulated question. My question for you is, when does the y-intercept occur? When do all y-intercepts occur? They occur when x equals 0. That's how or, and why we're ending up on the y-axis, because that point that I have an arrow to right here has an x-coordinate of 0. So for sure, it's going to be on the y-axis. This one happens to have a y-coordinate of 3 to go along with it. And finally, the, uh, and the function values indicated below the graph. Oh, down here. The first question is saying, what is f of negative 2? So this negative 2 right here is an x value. So when x equals negative 2, When x equals negative 2, we can come up to our curve, and there's a point right here, and I would say that has a y value of 3, so I'm going to answer this question with a 3. And what about f of positive 2? Move along the x-axis <clears throat> over to where we have an x value of 2, and then go down, in this case, to our curve, and it looks like maybe there's a point right here that's on our curve with an x value of 2, a corresponding y value of negative 5, and so I'm going to answer and say that f of 2 equals negative 5. Hey, that's the end of chapter 2, section 1. So just a little reintroduction to functions, function notation, a couple of definitions for you, a couple of illustrations. We've got domain, we've got range, we've got intercepts. And we found a lot of those things, if not all of those things, visually based on looking at graphs. We're also going to have to get to the point where we're comfortable finding those different values by looking at equations. But until then, I'm glad to see that we know how to do it using graphs. All right. I'm going to get out of here, and I will see you again in Chapter 2, Section 2. Thanks so much.